The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this first uh, MetroVision Idea Exchange webinar. Um, and we're calling it Transit Oriented Data TOD Resources for Metro Denver. Uh, my name is Kevin Priestley. I'm an assistant planner here at Dr. Cog. And with me, I have Chessie Brady, who is the TOD manager for the Regional Transportation District, or RTD. Um, and we're both really excited to, to be with you all today. Um, so this is just kind of an outline of the webinar. Um, we'll, we have a few announcements to get through. Um, and then we will uh, go right into presentations and we'll have a Q&A session at the end. Um, all of, we did have uh, about 45 uh, attend, people attend, uh, register to attend the event today. And so we will, uh, we'll just have everybody on mute and we'll do the Q&A period at the end of the webinar. Um, so everybody is aware uh, we have made AICB credits available. There's one credit available for this event. Um, you can find that through the APA website. Um, I will make the caveat that it is only available for a live screening of this event. Um, so just in case uh, you know folks didn't necessarily register, um, you can still access the credits through uh, through APA's website. Um, and we did want to just run a quick poll. Um, I know that not everybody who registered to attend is probably in the session quite yet. Um, however, we did want to run the poll and ask if you were watching with other people just to kind of get a sense of, of how many attendees we have total. Just give it another 30 seconds or so. All right. Yeah. Well, great. So, um, it looks like most people are watching this by themselves, which is great. Um, and, and just a, another reminder, if you do want the AICB credits, if you're watching the group four, um, to just you know consult through the APA website because you might not necessarily get a follow-up uh, email from, uh, from GoToWebinar. Um, our next uh, announcement on the Dr. Cog side is that we have made uh, we have uh, our UC stamp funding and MetroVision amendments cycle is currently live. Um, so we have a call for projects right now on the UC stamp side. Proposals are due on November 30th, um, and then we'll select projects in December and award funds in early 2019. Four types of planning studies are eligible through this opportunity. We've got station area master plan and urban center studies, next step studies, corridor-wide plans, and area planning and implementation strategy studies. Eligible sponsors include local governments, RTD, and nonprofits such as transportation management associations and business improvement districts. Uh, those organizations all have to meet specific criteria, and sponsors may submit any number of proposed studies, but Dr. Cog will fund only up to two studies per sponsor per fiscal year. Uh, for more information, you can use the link um, on the uh, on the presentation, which I will make available to everybody at the conclusion of this webinar, um, or you can contact Eric Webb and his contact information is there. Um, we're also soliciting amendments to the 2040 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan and the MetroVision Plan. The Dr. Cog Board is anticipated to act on all amendments by the middle of uh, 2019. And uh, for 2040 uh, MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan amendments, those must meet federal fiscal constraint requirements. Uh, if you're submitting uh, MVRTP amendments, please contact Jacob Rieger. If you're interested in submitting MetroVision plan or urban center amendments, contact Derek Webb. Uh, we also, this is um, gonna be the final announcement on the Dr. Cog side, um, but we are 
Uh, we also do have an open comment period for the active transportation plan. We will be accepting comments through November 25th, 2018. Um, you can access uh, the comment box through that link. You can also go to drcog.org slash ATP or contact Emily Lindsay, our active transportation planner. Yeah. Okay. Oh, no. Okay. And then uh, we'll just I'll turn it over to Chessie to uh, talk about some uh, announcements from RTD. Thanks. So, yeah, just a few quick announcements. On December 12th, we have our third local government meeting of the year. These We do these three to four times a year. And this one, uh, December 12th, 2 to 4 p.m. at the RTD offices on Blake Street, will be focused on the regional BRT study. So if you're interested in where we are with that, please um, give us a, um, you know, figure, let me know um, if you'd like to attend and we can get you an invitation. We're also still working on our first last mile study, uh, which is, should be finishing up in 2019. So look out for the results of that. And then next year, uh, we are planning to begin a new long range plan, which we haven't done since Fast Tracks. Uh, so this will be a multi year effort for us. Uh, many, maybe some of you were able to attend our transportation transformation summit a couple months ago. This is going to lead on from that um, and include uh, looking at our, our system uh, from basically from scratch. What, what can change over the next um, and in the next decades, where are we going and, and what's, what's the new plan um, or how do we finish up fast tracks? So, turn back to you, Kevin. Awesome. Um, yeah, so if you're interested in any of those opportunities, um, please please contact Chessie, please contact uh, us at, over at Dr. Cog. Um, so, I'll get into the perspectives on transit report. Um, we made this available earlier this summer. Um, and before I get into the findings, uh, I do just want to give you a sense of the outline for the presentation today. Um, so I will get into key insights, uh, but there are a couple caveats that are important to note when using this data set. Um, it's really rich and you can answer or pose a lot of questions using it, um, but there are a couple of things that you need to know about data use before you start, uh, start using it. The data set is available publicly on our regional data catalog, which is a tremendous resource for the Denver region. There's tons of rich data that you can access um, to support different planning or even uh, you know, academic research uh, that you might want to do. Um, so that general link is uh, data.drcog.org. And then when you receive the presentation PDF uh, at the end of the cert or at the end of the webinar, um, you can click that 2009 and 2016 survey data link, and that'll take you directly to the, the download on our website. So with that, um, I'll get into the purpose of the study a little bit. Um, so at, at Dr. Cog, we're interested in understanding how uh, regional investments in transportation affect development, uh, particularly spatial development patterns throughout the region. We're interested to, to, to know how transit affects economic trade-offs, particularly in housing and transportation. We're also interested in uh, how proximity to transit affects individuals' commute behaviors, particularly driving connected in with some of our congestion mitigation work. And the goal for the survey um, was ultimately just to, to learn how, how those things are changing uh, given, given the, the investment in uh, regional transportation that we've seen over the last uh, 15 years. So with that said, there, there are two surveys, um, 2009 and 2016. The 2009 survey we, we wanted to uh, use as a baseline to get a baseline understanding for how people factor transit into their location decisions. Um, what sort of transit usage rates are we seeing? What kind of economic benefits, both real and perceived, do people see um, through, through this investment? In 2016, we're, we're talking about this as a second data point in what we aspire to have be a long-term longitudinal study of location preferences around the Denver region. Um, and 2016 was a really good time for this to happen as uh, a number of new lines were set to come uh, online, if you will. Um, in terms of study areas, uh, the map at the right um, kind of gives you an idea of what we're what I'm going to be talking about in this presentation today. 
Uh, but we worked with a consultant to uh, draw one mile walk sheds around station areas. And that's how we decided our survey sample. In 2009, the survey had a larger footprint in that it was mailed to residents and businesses both inside and outside of those walk sheds. In 2016, by contrast, residents and businesses outside walk sheds were excluded from the survey. And that's just because, as you can see on the map, the, the footprint got so large that sending out surveys would have been uh, cost prohibitive to that, to that large of, of, a, of a segment. Um, so the map at the right shows those one mile walk sheds and we included some, um, some points or some rather some buffer, one mile buffers around those station areas uh, to show, to give a better sense around those areas that might not have uh, great walk sheds or, or there were data limitations around those walk, uh, for those walk sheds. I'm gonna refer to the green areas in this map through the rest of the presentation as mature lines which simply means that they were constructed before 2009 and were surveyed in both years. Whereas the purple areas on the map had either opened or were planned to open soon after the survey was mailed. Um, there were a few areas, this is just a note and I'll return to this later, but we did have a few areas that were purposefully oversampled. And so the 2016 data has been weighted in order to reduce the influence of that oversample. So now we'll get into the insights and, and kind of describe um, how, we, how we slice the data. So as I mentioned, um, we started off with a research question um, and, and part of this broader effort to have a, a longitudinal report, we wanted to look at how things appear to be changing between 2009 and 2016. Uh, we sent surveys out to residents, uh, we sent surveys out to businesses in those areas, and then in the business survey, we included a follow-up question that could go to um, employees and, and um, employers. So we, we got uh, surveys sent out to, to all of those folks. Um, what I'm going to present on is not the only way that you can slice the data. Like I mentioned before, it's really rich. There are you know hundreds of columns in the Excel spreadsheet um, that you can divide this up any, any kind of way that you would like. Um, it can be sliced up by corridor, by the age of the corridor. You can look at it in terms of mode choice, by socioeconomic status, by neighborhood type. We asked about the number of cars people owned and the number of bikes people owned. And so there are a lot of really interesting potential research questions that you can ask using this data set. So with that said, I'll just jump right into the resident survey. Um, and uh, we, we, we asked residents about trip behaviors or travel behaviors. We didn't ask them to complete a trip diary as there might be in uh, a potentially more, more rigorous approach to this question. But we did them ask them to assess the mode they use to cover the most distance on their commutes. According to the data, there hasn't been a major change in commuting behavior between the two, two study periods. There's been fairly similar levels of driving and transit usage. However, what we have seen is a, a a difference between uh, mature rail lines and the system as a whole, um, where people who live in mature rail lines are less likely to drive their vehicle alone, slightly more likely to walk or bike, and on any given day, they're more likely to rely on multiple transportation modes. In terms of location preferences, uh, we asked residents what they would look for in their current home. Um, and I won't cover these questions, but we also asked why they moved from their previous home and why they would look to move in the future. Um, this table basically shows why people chose to live within high frequency transit corridors in, 20, uh, in 2016. Um, so what we find, which shouldn't surprise anybody who's been studying the Denver region, is that cost of housing has become an increase, it has, has increased um, in, in its relevance to people's location decisions. Um, at least two thirds of respondents in 2016 reported cost as one of their top four reasons for moving to the place that they currently live. Um, what might be interesting to note for municipal planning efforts and economic development professionals is that perspectives data indicate that having experiential retail nearby, uh, particularly at the bottom, you can see coffee shops, restaurants and bars, easy access to transit service and easy access to downtown, those sort of factors um, increased uh, in, in residents' location decisions uh, in 2016, um, particularly uh, in, in those areas um, 
that uh, are in those newer transit corridors that, that may not have uh, as much levels of TOD in, in them. Um, we also asked, uh, this kind of gets into what I had mentioned about socioeconomic uh, status and, and the sorts of questions that you can slice the data. Um, we asked residents to report um, demographic and socioeconomic indicators. Um, and this is what they reported in terms of housing cost, housing types, and ownership. Um, so not only do they report cost being a bigger factor in location decisions, but resident respondents also report paying more uh, for rent or for their mortgage in 2016 than they did in 2009. I will just note that these are in nominal terms and not in real terms, um, so just have that caveat in mind. Um, what remains uncertain about these kind of numbers and might be the uh, intriguing for fault for further study is whether or not this is an effect of um, rents near transit locations uh, as, as an effect of a hot regional housing market, or if it may indicate that uh, residential demand near transit areas still outstrips supply in those, in those transit accessible locations. Um, in terms of the business and employee survey, we asked uh, some, some similar questions. Um, we asked business respondents what influenced their location decisions. And this slide shows what had, a, had somewhat or a strong influence on location decisions. And I should mention that this is in the abstract. We, didn't, we also followed up and asked why they moved to their current location um, and, and things like that that we did for the resident side as well. So at least four in five businesses reported car and parking access for customers and employees as an influence on location decisions. Although businesses still rank car access and parking as significant influences on location decisions, they also rank foot traffic higher in importance than they, than they previously did. Um, and particularly in, in foot traffic from rail stations and from, from nearby businesses. Um, so in essence, businesses surveyed in 2016, we can glean from the report, look to multimodal access as a benefit for themselves and their employees, and they have located in places that offer multimodal commute options. More to that parking and foot traffic, uh, we asked business respondents to reflect on the factors that led them to choose their current location. Um, so although businesses place a lot of value in having access by car for customers' employees, they also value foot traffic when they, uh, um, when, when they move to their current location, as I described. Um, at the bottom of that, though, uh, we also see a, a pretty significant uptick in how businesses, um, uh, in, in the number of businesses that reported employee, uh, have employees having access to restaurants, that experiential re retail point. Um, having access to grocery stores and personal services for their employees, um, that became more important to, to location decisions going forward. Um, we also asked in the employee survey what sorts of benefits they received from their employer. Um, so I do just want to note a quick caveat that if you download the publicly available report, this slide has updated information from that report. Um, so with that said, we asked respondents in the employee survey to report on the availability of trans, uh, transit benefit programs and how often they used different modes to get to work. Um, overall, uh, with the exception of free and subsidized transit passes, employees or employers are offering significantly more programs to their employees. Um, so things like flexible work schedules and secure bike storage and teleworking all became more prevalent in uh, business environments in 2016 than they were in 2009. Um, in terms of that table at the bottom, um, just the interesting thing to point out is the transit usage within mature rail corridors and the reported number of people who don't drive alone on most days. And this is kind of an interesting question because it gets to perception. Um, and this, uh, so do you have any employees? This is kind of a perception question of, of what number of employees do you have that use that mode um, for, for the most mileage in a given day. 
So I'll, with that, I'll, I'll jump into different uses that, that you might um, want to consider using this data set for. Um, just some sample case studies. Uh, there are some questions included in the survey uh, that have, and in addition with some work that the consultant did to assess built form. Uh, so you can look at built form characteristics and that effect on transit usage. There's a lot of ways to slice the socioeconomic characteristics. Um, we can look at location decisions in geographic mobility. Commute benefits and commute habits are people who receive commute benefits uh, changing their commute habits. And that's particularly important for certain programs at Dr. Cog, like our Way to Go team, um, which, which really works with business, businesses and residents to, to try and adjust commute behaviors. Um, and then you can also look at, at the relationship between location decisions and neighborhood amenities uh, by potentially incorporating some additional data sets, such as to plug our regional data catalogs park layer. Um, we've got a pretty robust park layer that you might be able to, uh, to use in conjunction with this study. So I do just want to get into a few caveats when using this data set, and this will be my final slide um, before I turn it over to Chessie. But the data in the 2016 survey is statistically significant at the corridor level only. Um, just to reiterate that point, 2016 station area data is not significant, statistically significant. And to that point, we have actually scrubbed station uh, indicators from the data set that we've made publicly available just to try and avoid uh, a, a potential misuse of that data. Um, it's important to remember the different scope of the survey years if you're trying to use a, a comparative time frame to look at the data. Um, just know that 2009 included people who were outside of transit areas, whereas 2016 did not. Um, additionally, there are survey weights on 2016, uh, and those are even weighted by the question that you're asking. So make sure if you use it to be conscious of those weights and where those come in. Lastly, um, when you download the data, you'll get a zip file that includes a data dictionary, and that's essentially the only way that you'll be able to use the data properly um, because the column headers have things like Q12X underscore 123, and that's what a column header will look like, um, whereas in the data dictionary, that'll say question 12 you know, the, the, uh, and then give you a value for what those things mean. Um, so with that, I just want to say thank you again for listening to the presentation today, and uh, I will turn it over to Chessie shortly. Yeah, and we'll do questions at the end just to reiterate that point. Thanks, Kevin. Right, so then I'm Chessie Brady, I'm the TOD manager at RTD, and I'm going to be talking about different ways of measuring the impact of transit uh, from a TOD perspective. So transit is often measured in miles or number of stations, number of trains, uh, service levels. Uh, but we also get asked a lot, what, what has transit really done for economic development in the region? Um, you know, has it, has it actually generated, generated change? And so we have a number of ways of trying to answer this question, and I'm going to go through, uh, go through them and then um, hopefully figure out how we can help you answer those questions for your, for your jurisdictions. So just, just to start out, a quick refresher, what is TOD? Uh, so as we think about it, it's compact development within about 10 minutes of a um, high-frequency station, BRT or rail. You can think of those walk sheds that, that Kevin just showed. Uh, ideally, it's a mix of uses, residential, retail, and office. Um, and those developments would be oriented towards pedestrians, which means they are not oriented towards cars. Uh, so ideally, lower parking levels and uh, wider sidewalks much more. Um, why do we do TOD? Uh, mostly because it's efficient. It's an efficient use of land and infrastructure. It's the opposite of sprawl. Uh, varied land uses allow for walkability, um, greater livability, more walking, more transit use means less car use, uh, which means less congestion, better air quality. There are lots of reasons to do TOD. Um, so just a few. So RTD's role in TOD, I always like to make clear, because uh, TOD is mostly being, being done by the private sector. Uh, 
But RTD is involved uh, certainly in station area planning, and Kevin mentioned that Dr. Cog is offering those grants again. So um, RTD is always happy to be, to be part of those processes, coordinating between our, our service development team and um, our engineers and your planners to make sure the information is, is getting traded back and forth. Um, again, we're, the TOD group is, we're, we hope we're a source for local information and best practices. I guess this, this presentation would be an example of that. And then um, as far as coordination on actual development projects, the, the TOD group tries to be that go-between with our engineering department so that we can smooth out the process of development at or near our stations and um, tracks. And then in addition to that, we also encourage TOD on RTD land um, through partnerships, and that we call joint development. And again, I like to be pretty clear about what joint development is, because I think that's something that um, can be confused. So here's just an example, Alameda Station, south of Denver, on the central line. Um, the potential for TOD is, is great, uh, and there is a lot happening there right now. That Kmart's been torn down, there's uh, residential development going in, lots of big plans. But so that's all in the private sector, basically, that, that you know, Within a half a mile of the station, there's a lot of potential for TOD. RTD's control is limited to the land that we actually own or owned um, at Alameda Station. We had um, parking there, a park and ride, and we were able to, in 20, uh, in, in time for a 2016 opening, uh, sell that land to a developer, um, create a successful joint development, and, and the uh, D4 Urban built the denizen. And, and our park and ride, our, our parking spaces were reallocated into that seat of parking you see on the right and a little bit to the south. So just, just to make that distinction between joint development where RTD really has a lot of control and TOD around the station uh, where we play a role and, and you know uh, are involved, but it's we're not directly behind it, aside from putting in the transit, of course. Um, so this presentation is really going to focus on the um, private side of TOD, since that's where most of the uh, development has happened. So I'm going to go through these four different ways we have of, um, or that exist of looking at the impact of transit uh, from a, a development point of view. Um, and then again, uh, we'll answer questions at the end. So uh, lots of agencies around the country have these great uh, economic impact numbers. Um, about everything that their transit investment has brought to the area. So Dallas, $10.8 billion in economic development since 1999. Houston, $8 billion in development since 2004 on investment of $300 million. That's a great return on investment, and that's a compelling number that they're able to put out uh, for marketing you know, if they want to convince their taxpayers they made a good investment or bring developers to the, to the jurisdiction. Um, and RTD does not have that number. Uh, we could, uh, you know, for a good chunk of mon money, we could employ our consultants to generate a number like that. But when you go through all these these links for the different um, for the different ways different people have done these analyses in their in their communities, uh, it, it's it, there's a lot of different ways of doing it. Uh, there's a lot of different calculations. And while it, while it is a great marketing number, um, it's hard for me personally anyway to, to feel like I can throw those numbers around and be really confident in them. So what we've tried to do is come up with more concrete ways of, of establishing impact of transit in Denver. So one way that we're working on right now, and this is not available for public consumption at the moment, but um, I'd be happy to talk about it on a, on a one off basis, is what, I've call, what I'm calling today a TOD trend tool. I'm not sure that name will stick, uh, but it's, it's essentially an interactive Excel database uses CoStar data, which of course has its own limitations, but um, basically working with our consultants, we've been able to pull CoStar data for uh, Boulder and Denver MSAs, and then um, focus in on the particular stations and corridors so that we can make comparisons between development at a given station versus its corridor or versus the whole MSA, um, and see where development is really happening. Um, and to some of the points that Kevin um, was talking about, I think this would be a great way to build on the perspectives data. Uh, for example, when it comes to rent, with our, with our data source, we can look at how has rent changed over time uh, at a given station. And, and you might be able to make some really interesting um, conclusions by, by combining, combining all these data sets. So just for, for an example, uh, some outputs that are available now, since 2005, 
we've had 12.8 million square feet of um, office, 25,000 uh, units of multifamily um, built within half a mile of stations. So that's that's a huge, uh, huge development that's happened right around our stations. Um, and we are also able to compare that to you know, what percentage of that is within the whole MSA, what's, you know, how does this represent um, development across the region? And of course, it's, what we see is that it's really concentrated right around the transit lines. Um, for example, 18% of new office and 8% of the multifamily units in the Denver MSA since 2005 have been built within half a mile of Union Station. So that investment in Union Station has really generated a significant amount of development um, in the area. Of course, we know that just looking at the map, but having some numbers to back it up um, can be really uh, useful. And from a, you know, these are um, Denver numbers or Union Station numbers, right? We can do this for any any station. We can look at how that station relates to the MSA as a whole. Uh, so this, this tool is um, still being refined. Uh, but if, if you feel like it would be useful to you, uh, please be in touch and we can figure out uh, how to work with you to get what you the answers that you're looking for. So I also wanted to draw your attention to the quality of life report. Uh, this is a uh, report that's done oops, sorry, that's okay, done annually uh, in, in one shape or another. And it's a really amazing uh, um, assemblage of of data and it's also beautifully illustrated and, and easy to read um, and that's available on our website now. I mean I just picked uh, out a few TOD-ish uh, slides but for example it uses the housing and transportation index to show that people who live near stations end up paying less for transportation and housing. Um, it also uh, uses our uh, TOD data to look at changes in office retail and institutional development over the years. Um, and then it uses good old census data too, um, to show housing starts over time and, and um, as that relates to different corridors. So it's a great source of um, data that's already available and is updated on an annual basis. Um, and so we'll have links to that at the end as well. Um, and then lastly, um, and I think most significantly, uh, we have that TOD database and and what I'm calling today, TOD and pictures, it's a working title. Um, so the TOD database uh, is um, the, the output of a lot of effort going station by station and finding every development that we can um, within about a half mile of, of all of our BRT and, and rail stations. And you can see, I mean, I just took a screenshot here, and we'll make this available in, in the next few weeks, but we have every property address, you know, how, how far is it from the station, um, is, is it residential or retail, how many units, are they affordable, um, and then you can see on the left we have links to the map, links to the, the property. So I, I hope that it will be a useful document for other people, and, and it's also something that we'll be updating regularly and we're always we'll always be looking for feedback on since you know, the development's changing all the time this, this database will have to be updated all the time as well um, so we've used that database to then create these slides uh, that I screenshot on the bottom there for each corridor we show what development has happened at each station um, illustrated which I think you know it's nice to have a database sometimes it's good to be able to crunch the numbers but sometimes you really want something that you can share with you know, a marketing department or you know, other other um, departments in your agency or, or developers to show it, to really show what's going on um, on a line or at a particular station. And so again, this this will also be available, um, and it's also an evolving document. And and if there are, perhaps there are developments we have missed, um, or you know we think that we, you know, we have the unit count wrong, and we we'd love to get that feedback from from you as well. Uh, so just a summary of the database, because uh, we were able to pull some interesting numbers, and this is based on just our vetting of every single building um, in the, in the uh, station areas. Um, and we end up with, uh, so it's, we're looking at dense development within a half mile walk of a station that was constructed either just prior to or after the um, opening of the rail or, or BRT line. So. Um, arguably as a consequence of that transit investment. And we see 39,500 residential units, 10 million square feet of office, million and a half square feet of retail, 2,800 hotel rooms. So 
is transit responsible for all this all of this development? Maybe not. Maybe some of it would have happened without the, the transit investment. But I think a case can be made that we've had a significant impact on development in the region. And I mean, these are the numbers that kind of show that. And I, one thing to note is that this doesn't include downtown Denver because A, we didn't attempt to uh, categorize every single building in downtown Denver, um, but also I would say that's not arguably TOD since it's not because of the rail. So that's my caveat there. Uh, so then I wanted to go through a few of our um, TOD and pictures slides um, to talk about why there's um, why TOD has happened in some stations and not in others. And it's, it's not surprising, um, these factors that have to come together to uh, enable TOD uh, market, the zoning, you have to have the infrastructure, the jurisdiction has to be there, and then the, the ownership and, and the lot size has to be there. So I thought, you know, I'm not going to walk you through every corridor, but just to take a handful of them to, to talk about. So the central line, as um, Kevin mentioned, one of our mature lines, um, you can look at I-25 and Broadway, where uh, there's a huge, you know, one large landowner right at the station who's just starting to get off the ground. Uh, but even all around that, there have been dense developments going up since 2008. And that's a function of the market, of course. The, the market is there. You're close to downtown. You're also accessible to Denver Tech Center. The zoning is there for the density. Um, the community is not opposed. Uh, the jurisdiction is, is certainly in favor of, of development at that location near the station. Um, and then the lot size is allowed. So all of those things have to come together for this development to happen. Uh, if you look two stops to the left or to the north, 10th and Osage, it's a slightly different story where we have one large landowner, the Denver Housing Authority, who in redoing their, their housing there has been able to master plan um, their development to uh, do mixes of affordable and, and market units and, and really increase the density at that location. Um, and they're able to do that because they're, they're a single landowner. By contrast, um, if you go further down the, on the southwest, uh, there's a little bit happening in Evans. Um, Englewood had a big push in, in 2000, and this you know, has, has some big plans coming up. Um, but then it, it slows down a little bit as you go down the corridor. Oxford, City of Sheridan, there's, uh, there's big box stores, there's industrial. We have the one uh, residential um, development, but the land use there and um, proximity then to single family homes right adjacent. Um, maybe the market's quite not there. Maybe if the jurisdiction isn't pushing it, um, though there's a lot that could happen there. And so over time, um, it could change significantly. Similarly, in, in Littleton, downtown Mineral, there's a lot of potential. Um, but the, uh, if the jurisdiction and the community aren't on board for high density, um, it's, it's not, the developers aren't going to come. So all of those factors really have to be um, lining up to get TOD. Just another example, Bellevue, um, on the right side of the slide there, you have one single large landowner, again, who's able to master plan their community, do mixed use. They put in um, Western Union's new headquarters. And then similarly around that, like I-25 and Broadway, you have residential um, popping up. And again, the market's there. You have DTC. Um, the zoning is there. You have the developers are, are ready to go, and, and it, it becomes a successful project. And the West Line is a, is a totally different kind of example. It, as a line, it has a... a good density of TOD, but on any given station, there's only you know, one to three, which given where the line runs, makes it just makes sense. And a lot of this is pretty logical. Uh, if you're running through residential neighborhoods that are largely single family homes, um, it takes time for the jurisdiction to put in the zoning, for the developers to see the potential and um, for developments to go in. Though we're seeing a lot, a lot has going gone in and there's still a lot more coming. Um, so, and I think that Again, as Kevin showed, those mature uh, lines versus the new lines, uh, TOD takes time. Um, that's probably the other factor, um, that people have different responses to um, the planning of the line, the uh, construction, and then the opening. Uh, but even in Old Town Arvada, we have a lot of TOD, and of course, the line will be opening soon. Uh, so to summarize, economic, impact, economic impact analysis, we don't have it. We don't plan to do it. Um, it's a cool number, um, but we don't have one. The DOD trend tool is coming soon, and uh, if you're interested in learning more about that, please contact me. I'd be happy to work through um, your particular station or your corridor and um, 
um, work through that with you. Quality of Life Study, available now, check it out. And then the TOD database and uh, TODM pictures will be available on our website in the next couple of weeks. The easiest way, I didn't put it up here because the um, URL is pretty long, but the easiest way to find the TOD website is just Google RTD, TOD, and we come up and we have a lot of resources up there as well. Um, so again, for all of this, we'd be very open to your feedback and um, hope that it's helpful. Uh, can everybody can everybody hear us? Can anybody hear us? Uh, looks like we may have lost some audio from people. Hopefully that uh, has a no. It doesn't have no audio. <laughs> no. I don't know what we can do other than call in, uh, but that would take up take up some some time. It's picking something up. Yeah. It's picking up, but the problem is the uh, maybe. Okay. Oh, restored. Okay. Can everybody hear us again? Ooh, okay, so we should be back. Um, so I just want to, you know, thank thank Chessie so much for presenting on that. Um, hopefully, hopefully you, we weren't out uh, out of audio. audio, audio. Um, so uh, with that, um, please uh, address us any any questions that you might have. Um, I can. Here we go. Um, yeah. So so feel free to, to ask us any questions. See if Teddy's around. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay. Sorry, I think we lost a couple of people. Um, <clears throat> apologies, apologies for that, uh, for losing that. Um, so, uh, what Jesse was saying at the TOD trend yeah. tool. So we, it looks like we cut out at the TOD trend tool. Oh, okay. Um, so if you just want to kind of summarize the last two points. Okay, great. Right, sure. The so the, the TOD trend tool is, is coming soon. If you're interested in in uh, in that, please contact me, and I'd love to work with you to, to use that data to your benefit. Um, the QOL study is available, ready to go. Again, it's chock full of information and really worth worth your time to look through. And then the TOD database, the TOD in the picture is, is available now. Um, it will be on the RTD's website soon. Um, and you can also um, contact me if you have any questions, especially if you have any feedback or um, updates, new developments we missed, anything like that. We, we'd love to have your input uh, on all of our tools. Great. Um, so thank you so much, Chessie, for, for presenting um, on all those data resources. It should be, should be great use um, going forward. And so uh, with that, we can, we'll, move on to, uh, we'll move on to questions. Um, that you might have, um, so please use our please use the chat box and or the questions feature in GoToWebinar. Raise your hand to ask questions. Um, we will still keep everybody muted just because there there's uh, you know about thirty people uh, on the line. So, um, what do we have? Any questions? Um, so we have one question. Uh, if, uh, so this is for, for us, Dr. Cog. Um, did Dr. Cog, uh, in the perspective survey, ask if or when people moved? Did they typically move closer or farther from work? Um, we did actually ask if people move uh, if people reported they moved. We asked where they moved from, uh, but that's a jurisdiction to jurisdiction basis. And so, in terms uh, of, we didn't ask if they moved closer or farther from work. Um, in 2016, I'll say the caveat, we did ask in a, in a, a question about commute behaviors if, uh, or about location preferences if they moved houses to be closer to work. But as far as like a, an actual mileage number, um, probably wouldn't be a, a necessarily a good use for that data. Not seeing any other questions at the moment. 
So we're not seeing other questions at the moment. Um, I, I have a question for you, Jesse. Um, so I guess um, are, you talked a lot about, um, you know, like lot size and assemblage. What, what are some strategies that local governments might be able to put in place to encourage TOD developments? I, I, I think what we see is that the, the station area planning is really the, the best way to start as far as make, getting the plan in place um, so that TOD will come. Um, having the zoning in place, but then also having the an infrastructure plan. Maybe maybe the road isn't doesn't support development, or the sewers aren't there. Um, and so a lot of um, so there's both the planning side of that, and then there's the actual um, um, capital side. And um, the more that a city can be ready to incentivize financially um, the creation of the infrastructure that enables the higher density development, um, that's also that's definitely where we see um, development happening. Um, and and also just being um, being involved and being aware, being open to um, the development um, and helping facilitate, sometimes helping facilitate that developer conversation with RTD, uh, depending on the location. Um, the more the jurists, from an RTD perspective, the more uh, the jurisdiction is interested in seeing de development at a location, the, the more easier it is for us to, to back them and work with them and, and work through any complications that might arise from being close to a station or close to tracks. So it's, it's really is, it's about all the, the partnerships too that have to happen to make the, the development happen. So we still, still, uh, still not having a ton of questions out there. Um, so I don't know. Um, I mean, I've got, I've got a, I could ask you. So yeah. when you, so the, the, the 2016 perspectives, what's, what happens next with data collection? Are you done? Is there more coming? Uh, so the, the time, that's a, that's a great question. So the timeline going forward is we, we would like to do this every, every five to six years if possible. Um, and that kind of depends on how we want to we send out the survey. We, we narrowed down the survey a lot between 2009 and 2016. And I think that doing that, um, gave us a, a little bit more consistency with our with our data. So we're going to look um, probably out to like 2020 uh, to start scoping what that survey is going to look like with the hope to, to have the survey complete by 2021 and the, the data available in 2022 or something like that. So that's kind of what it looks like moving forward. Um, you know, we kind of want this to supplement around uh, different, you know, ACS and census years. So it's a different kind of source of, of data that people might be able to use in kind of those intervening years where, you know, those really rich, publicly available, massive data sets might um, might not be as, as, as relevant in those off years. So it... Um, so, I do have one. How does RTD work with cities uh, along mature lines that don't have much TOD development? Um, how do you uh, try to shift the conversation to advocate for TOD? That's a, that's a good question. It's tough because, of course, we don't have the land use authority, uh, and it is, it is up, largely up to the jurisdiction. Um, so, I mean, on one hand, this, over this past summer, we met with pretty much every jurisdiction that RTD covers, or where we have a station or a BRT station, um, to try to create that, continue that relationship with each, with each, with the planners at each uh, location. Um, and we try to, I mean, I think it's things like this, we try to make the information available, like look, look at what's happening elsewhere in the region, um, and, but every, every station is really different and every jurisdiction is different. Um, I think we, we're always willing to help, and I think maybe what we need to do better is, is communicate with jurisdictions about how we're available to, to, be, to support them as they're trying to, to do development, whether that means um, connecting them with other jurisdictions that are uh, doing, you know, getting it done, or um, with developers, or um, grant resources, or, or infrastructure. 
um, challenges that exist. One other thing we've done that I we've gone through every station um, and categorized it as far as its potential for TOD. And so we've looked at we basically have a set of challenges for each for each station. So when we talk to jurisdictions, we, we address those challenges um, that we've identified and um, and we get jurisdictions that have dealt with them already. Um, and basically just keep the conversation going. If there's potential for development at these locations and we just have to get over the hurdles um, and um, we have to partner to get it done. Look. Lost sound again. That was a great answer. It's too bad, no. <laughs> it's bad. It's a pack. Uh, it's, it seems like, like sound keeps going out. We, uh, we have a network quality low indicator in our sound check bar. Um, lost. It's been lost. Audio connection restored. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen only mode. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I apologize for these sound issues. If it, you know, there's always something that goes, uh, goes haywire in these first, first run throughs. Um, so the, the question that, uh, that Chessie was in the middle of answering was about how you kind of can transfer around what, what we've seen as kind of like an anti-growth sentiment in certain places and, and how you can become an advocate for, for TOD. So I don't know if you have, Chessie gave this really amazing answer that I don't think anybody heard the second half of, um, maybe it got recorded. but it might have gotten recorded. Um, <laughs> So uh, yeah, we we did have another question um, for you, Chessie, about uh, the the role that that bus and BRT plays in in TOD, and how that might be different from a you know fixed route rail line. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think, um, and I didn't do the close up of the Flatiron Flyer um, slide that we have, but what you can see is that there's a lot of development going on. Um, in those flat iron fire stations. And um, I mean, I think this is a question nationally is does BRT generate TOD? Um, and from our, from what we can see, again, if all those factors are there, if the market is there, the zoning is there, the jurisdiction's on board, um, having that, having that bus stop can be um, kind of the last piece that makes the development happen in that location. Um, and we're certainly seeing it on the flat iron flyer, um, but of course we would place those those um, stops strategically as well. So there's there's some chicken and egg question um, as there is with much of TOD. Uh, but yeah, I think that's that's a, a national question that people are trying to figure out: is do you have to do the full rail investment in order to get the benefit, um, the economic development benefit, or does BRT um, is BRT enough to convince? developers, um, or do they think it's enough to convince potential residents or, or um, tenants um, that the development makes sense? Um, I, I think the jury is still out, but what we see uh, along the Flatiron Flyer is that there's there's certainly potential. Okay, yeah, another question related to BRT is um, BRT on Colfax. Um, are there, do you know if, like, if there's anything in the pipeline, um, TOD related along the Colfax corridor? This kind of gets into your chicken and egg question, too. Um, yeah. yeah, it's a good, uh, yeah, good question. I, and I, I didn't mention Colfax just now, though I was thinking about it. I mean, the city of Denver is uh, engaged in a uh, planning effort, and we're, we're involved as well, um, but a study of Colfax uh, from a TOD perspective. And uh, I mean, I, a lot of the issues are on Colfax have to do with lot size. You, there's it's a lot of small lots and you'd have to consolidate them in order to do a really high quality dense development there. Um, so that, that I know that's one concern they're looking at. Um, but I think, and I think part of what the study is looking at is what, what is the potential for TRD and um, what, what can make it happen? And we, and we don't know the answer and that's why we're doing the study. Um, but are, are the, is the financing right? Um, I mean, the traffic along Colfax, the transit that exists already, um, can, it, it makes it a really um, valuable corridor, I think. And so I think the potential for TUD is pretty is pretty high. It, um, but you do have to get around that the lot size issue and what cities can do to facilitate 
consolidating or you know, assembling parcels, I, I'm, I'm less familiar with that. I hope the study, maybe the study will get into it. Well, great. Um, we've got another question. Um, we're going to a little bit confusingly, um, but basically uh, asking about the process for buying up properties close to stations, particularly in BRT. Has there, uh, I'm guessing, has there been a lot of uptick in that that you've noticed and or what does that process kind of look like? Um, I'm not, I'm not sure how to answer. I think, um, I mean, we see, we certainly see development along the Flatiron Flyer and property changing hands. Um, as far as, I don't know if it's that, perhaps asking about RTD land, which I can speak, which I can speak more to than, than private land. Um, we are always, as I mentioned, we are, and you may not have heard me, but I mentioned um, we categorized all of our stations into um, to determine their potential for development and based on the size of RTD land, um, generally park and rides and um, the market and all those things I mentioned, what's the, what's the potential for development at that site? And that includes the BRT stations. And I think we see um, on RTD land, we certainly see potential for development in park and rides along the Flatiron Flyer. Um, as far as uh, private land, um, changing hands, I'm not, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, well, seeing, uh, yeah, so there's only about, we've only got about four minutes left in the webinar today. Um, and I did just want to, uh, say that when you leave the webinar, you will be asked to fill out an evaluation survey. Please fill that out. We tried to make it as short as possible. I see people leaving the, the chat as I'm <laughs> giving this information about the evaluation. Um, but if you could please uh, fill that out, that would be great. It would be really helpful for us as we go forward with these uh, these remote events. Um, we're looking at doing another one in December, and we will have an in-person idea exchange at our downtown offices, at Dr. Cog's downtown offices on November 28th. Um, and you should be receiving information about that um, in the next few days, if not early next week. Um, so with that, I just want to thank everybody for listening in. I want to apologize for the sound issues. We'll hope to have those resolved by the next time we do this. And I do just want to uh, you know, say thank you again to RTD um, for, for coming in and speaking and to Chessie uh, for being an awesome panelist and, and all the work that, that, uh, that you guys do over there. Um, so with that, uh, thanks everybody and reminder to fill out the evaluation. <laughs>